Welcome everybody to July's Armchair Travel event. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this beautiful sunny evening here in Cambridge. It's great to see so many of you coming back to enjoy these events and to see some new faces in the crowd too. I very much hope you enjoy this evening's talk. I'm delighted to say that this event is being hosted by Last Frontiers who run our travel programme Latin American Tours and they have been working with us for the last four years. I'm delighted to also introduce and welcome this evening's speaker, Dr. David Bearfuss Jones, affiliated scholar of the MacDonald Institute of Archaeological, Archaeological Research here in Cambridge. Just to remind you all, all the armchair travel events are recorded, including this one. And if you have missed any of the events we've previously held, please do check them out on the Cambridge Alumni website. On that note, I'd like to hand over to Ed Payne from Last Frontiers. Thank you very much, Claire. That's really kind. Um, just a really quick intro from me. Uh, my name is Ed Payne, as Claire said, I run Last Frontiers, specialist tour operator to Latin America. And for the last four years, we've been working with the alumni uh, uh, organizing their South America trips, which has been great fun, albeit, albeit interrupted for a while. Um, as it says on the screen, I've got a special offer for any alumni who don't have our guidebook. Send us an email. I'll put a uh, a link in the chat and be delighted to send you one. And I thought I'd just really quickly mention the three upcoming tours we are organizing. Uh, one this year with uh, Professor Roger Davies to Argentina with the um, uh, complementary themes of astronomy and wine. Uh, Roger is uh, Professor of Astrophysics at Oxford. In February, we are taking a trip to learn all about the Panama Railroad, which is an unusual tour, but it was inspired by this book, which uh, was written by the trip scholar, Peter Pine from Ulster University. And I found it so fascinating that I thought uh, a tour could work around it. So that'll be interesting to see uh, how many of you like that idea. Um, and then in April, uh, we're off with David to uh, Peru and uh, a tour very much focusing on the Nazca um, people, but not forgetting uh, the rest of the Peruvian culture in the high Andes. Uh, so about six days spent on the south coast uh, uh, in and around Nazca lines from above, from below, um, but then at the end of the trip up to Machu Picchu and Cusco and the Sacred Valley. Uh, so that's my intro. I hope you didn't, uh, I didn't bore you with that. Um, I too would now like to introduce David. Before I do, I just thought I'd tell you that David will probably speak for about 45 minutes. Um, and if you've got a question for him, I've received a couple by email already. Uh, please just pop it in the chat and I will collate the questions at the end uh, and put them to him. So David, as I said, has been traveling to uh, Peru for 20 years or so, uh, leading a program of field work and research. He's led six tours to Peru. He's written five books, uh, published at least 50 articles. So I think there's no one better qualified to talk to us tonight about the place of Andean civilization in the human story. And I will now stop sharing my screen and hand over to you, David. Thank you, Ed, for that nice introduction. Thanks, everyone, for joining the presentation. Thank you for your interest. I'm going to share my presentation now. Uh, which hopefully everybody can see clearly. Uh, so the title I've given this is The Place of Andean Civilization in the Wider Human Story. And prov more provocatively, I suppose, one might uh, entitle it Machu Picchu is Sublime, So What? Because we could start with, with Machu Picchu, the, obviously the iconic Inca site high in the Andes, uh, and it's Machu Picchu which attracts uh, millions of tourists to Peru every year. Uh, it is indeed very beautiful. Uh, it captures this sort of Inca Zen uh, uh, architectural aesthetic whereby they're trying to meld their road roots and their uh, and their architecture with nature the whole time. 
And so for Keats, I suppose, that might be it. You know, beauty is truth, truth, beauty, and that is all you need to know. Um, what I'm going to do in this presentation, I suppose, from Keats would have it, that this is, is, is poor, cold philosophy and unweave the rainbow, because I want to go a bit beyond this beauty to show why Andean prehistory actually matters to the wider human story, to the way we are today. And the reasons for that, as we will see, I hope, are, 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 are much older than the Incas. Um, so this has the advantage of giving you a broad introduction to the prehistory of the Andean region. Um, and as we'll see, I will be uh, making a thesis that the importance of the Andes is uh, in this human story is largely because of the story of agriculture here. Now, that might seem uh, somewhat mundane, but uh, in fact, that is the foundation of a unique, uh, what some would call a pristine cultural trajectory. That is one which unfolded without influence from the outside. And the Andes was probably the last uh, pristine cultural flowering uh, on earth. So if we're thinking about the significance of agriculture, I think we've got to take a step back and, and look at uh, uh, human history in the, in the sort of big picture uh, and bear in mind that for almost all our existence as humans, uh, as the genus Homo for two million years, and even as m modern humans, Homo sapiens, for the last, let's say, 300,000 years, we have lived by hunting and gathering, tiny mobile populations moving through the landscape the whole time. And then, uh, suddenly, uh, simultaneously, quote unquote, in relatively few parts of the world, we completely changed our relationship with our environment and therefore with each other. And this, of course, is what's known as the agricultural revolution. And it is the single most critical change in the whole human trajectory because everything uh, that follows civilization, webinars like this, et cetera, et cetera, all follow from that fundamental initial change. And as I mentioned, what's curious about this great change is that it took place in relatively few places originally. Uh, and one of these was the Andes. Now, um, one of the first people to start thinking about agricultural origins was the Russian plant geneticist uh, uh, Nikolai Vavilov, um, who uh, in, the, in the early 20th century reasoned that the places where agriculture had started was likely to be the places where today you found the greatest diversity in crops. And so he traveled around the globe making collections of, of crops which uh, re now reside in a, in a very important collection in St. Petersburg. Uh, and uh, one of the places he traveled to uh, was the Andes, uh, making his crop collections. In the end, he was thrown into the gulag by, by the Stalinist uh, authorities because he refused to accept the pseudo-scientific uh, ideas of uh, heritability of Lysenko and so forth in the, in the Soviet era, and he died in the gulag. But you can see uh, Vavilov's logic when you're in, let's say, an Andean market, because there are upwards of 400 varieties of, of the potato uh, in the Andes today. That, of course, is the potato which uh, now dominates our diets, too. Now, the story of agricultural origins uh, in, the, in South America begins, uh, so far as we know, uh, probably in what one might call the neotropical lowlands. So that is the edges of Amazonia, where Amazonia abuts onto the eastern slopes of the, of the Andean mountain range. That is the region in which many of the wild ancestors of today's South American crops are found. Uh, and uh, it seems that that is where the process of uh, the gradual process of plant domestication first started taking place in South America. Now, the first hints of this are around about the beginning of the Holocene, uh, around about 10,000 years ago. So 
the story then uh, i mean the, the this this uh, origins of agriculture in south america is just as old uh, as as well, almost as old as it is in the so called old world then um but subsequently uh, the agriculture unfolded in very different ways and so then did uh, civilization and i've tried to capture that uh, peculiarity with this shot of the Coca Canyon in the Southern Andes uh, with the extraordinary terracing systems which are, have been uh, built there over, over thousands of years and which are necessary to carry out productive agriculture in this sort of landscape. So um, these uh, peculiarities I've, I've called uh, Andean uh, idiosyncrasies, if you like. And uh, the first one, is one which was originally identified uh, by uh, Jared Diamond in his uh, famous book, Guns, Germs and Steel, um, infamous book uh, for some archaeologists. But uh, I think that uh, this particular idea uh, is, is a very powerful one. And the argument he makes is that geography isolates the hearts of agriculture in the Americas more than it does in the old world. So uh, if one thinks about uh, domesticating a plant such as wheat in, in, uh, in, in the Near East uh, and then moving it across Eurasia to, let's say, China, obviously that entails huge distances and lots of environmental changes and so forth. But in terms of very important factors for plants such as day length and so forth, uh, it's an east-west transect. By contrast, if you're trying to move from, let's say, the temperate highlands of Mexico to the temperate highlands of the Andes, you have to go through the Darien Gap in Panama and uh, tropical jungles. And, and this means that these t poles of agricultural origins in the Americas were, relatively speaking, isolated compared to they were uh, compared to, to the old world. It seems that there was independent domestication of most important crops, um, except for maize, and we'll come on to that uh, shortly. Now, the sed second idiosyncrasy I I'd like to emphasize uh, in this story in the Andes is one of extreme environmental diversity. So what I'm trying to capture here is a transect across South America. And what you can see is that one moving from, uh, from uh, uh, west to east, one starts off at sea level in the Pacific Ocean and very rapidly goes up into the Andean Cordillera up to 6,000 meters uh, and a plus of, of, uh, of, of Cordillera and intermontane valleys and so forth before dropping down into the Amazon basin, which eventually then carries on for thousands of kilometers, almost flat until, you, until one gets to the Atlantic. So across that uh, altitudinal variation, the corollary of that is extreme ecological di diversity. Uh, and one of the, f uh, uh, there are many different ways of, of uh, categorizing ecological diversity. One of them is uh, Holdrich's uh, uh, categories, uh, come up, which he came up with in the 1960s of life zones. And it turns out that of say 100 or so of his life zones, no fewer than 84 are, are found across the Andes. So the Andes, the Andean region, uh, down to Amazonia, is capturing around about 80% of global ecological diversity. And so the story of agricultural origins then plays out through this huge altitudinal diversity. And it's one which is taking place in the tropics, because unlike many alpine ranges, the Andes is running straight through the tropics. That means that you have uh, uh, vegetation, uh, populations and so forth to very high altitudes. Now, the picture I'm showing in the background here is uh, uh, von Humboldt's uh, Naturgemeld. Um, von Humboldt was um, one of the first people who started thinking about um, how plant ecology varied with geography, and he was inspired indeed by the Andes. It was the first of his great trips which he went on, and he traveled to Chimborazo. This is Chimborazo, the volcano in Ecuador, in his, uh, in his diagram, um, which at the time was believed to be the, uh, the, the highest mountain in the world. And indeed, if you measure the 
height of mountains from the center of the planet rather than from sea level. It is, still is the highest mountain in the world. But anyway, it's, uh, it, it, it inspired uh, this idea of biogeography in uh, Alexander uh, von Humboldt. Uh, and of course, his great um, ideas then became uh, the foundations of ideas for Darwin and so forth. And this is von Humboldt talking about the Andes, just to try and sort of capture what sort of topography we're talking about. Crevices so deep that if Vesuvius were seated in the bottom, it wouldn't rise above the level of the ridges of the neighboring Sierra. So it's no surprise then that what we have uh, in the Andes uh, unfolding are many different agricultural complexes, at least three. We can think of perhaps a high elevation complex consisting of the potato, many other forms of tubers, uh, quinoa, camelids, uh, mid elevation one of beans, peanuts and so forth, and lowland uh, um, complex of squash, cotton, and chili peppers and so forth. So following the unfolding of agriculture then, society, complex society, civilization if you like, unfolded also over this huge um, altitudinal uh, vertical ecological diversity because of course what you have because of um, uh, of this sort of landscape is very dramatic ecological variation over relatively short horizontal distances and this is uh, I'm trying to reflect that in a in the painting here, this is the heart of the Andes, also of Chimborazo by, by Frederick Church and the American Sublime, a vast painting which um, uh, uh, sits in the Metropolitan in which, uh, in which he's trying to capture some of this extraordinary ec ecological variation up the uh, slopes of Chimborazo. And what happens then in society as it's unfolding across this landscape is an apparent ideal by Andean peoples to attain self-sufficiency by dispersing themselves over different ecological tiers. And that can give a society then a very broad range of agricultural products and it can diversify their subsistence risk so that if a crop fails at a particular altitudinal niche, they have a, another crop they can rely on at a, at a, at a different uh, ecological uh, tier. Uh, and in the end, what you get uh, as an outcome of this is what uh, John Moore, the uh, American anthropologist, famously described some time ago as a vertical archipelago of colonies, of, of ethnic groups in a mosaic. And this is the uh, explanation he invoked to explain an apparent uh, lack of market exchange in the Andes. There were uh, apparently uh, no markets in the ancient Andes when the Spanish first came across uh, 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 Cusco and so forth, in contrast to Mexico. Now, I put a question mark against that, because, but it's a bit beyond the, the topic of, of, uh, of this talk. But you have this, as a consequence then, this mosaic of ethnic groups dispersed across this very vertical landscape. And in time, this became written into the, the social fabric of the Inca Empire uh, itself. Um, but the main point I'm trying to get across here is that rather, as, rather than as one might expect, the Andean topography limiting or hindering the movement of people and ideas and so forth, in fact, this extreme topography was driving it. And a, in, a, 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 an outcome of that is that if one is moving across different ecologies, moving plants, let's say, through different ecologies on, this, on the uh, up. Uh, the vertical gradient, for instance, you start very quickly selecting for genetic factors which control uh, the timing of, of, uh, of uh, seed dispersal and so forth. And this is more or less the, the definition of domestication, plant domestication. And indeed, ever since Vavilov, uh, mountainous regions have been seen as foci of, of agricultural origins. Now, the third idiosyncrasy I'd like to highlight in the Andes here is obviously a picture of some uh, alpaca being sheared. It is the relatively uh, few herd animals available for domestication in the New World. In the Andes, there were uh, yamas and alpacas, uh, 
Um, but uh, compared to the old world, uh, th these are relatively limited, uh, relatively limited universe of, of animals. There were no animals which were capable of pulling heavy pl uh, plows through heavy earth, for instance, or carrying cavalry or so forth. There was no dairy. So the sort of pastoral life lifestyles which developed in the new world were manifestly different to those in the old world. The fourth idiosyncrasy is uh, the marine ecosystem off the western coast of South America in the Pacific, thanks to cold upwellings from the deep submarine trench and the Humboldt current and so forth up the uh, coast. And this creates uh, what is in fact the world's richest marine ecosystem. And I'm trying to reflect that in a picture of the sea lion colony here off the coast of uh, on, on Paracas on the south coast of Peru. Uh, you can also try and look at it in in uh, in fishing statistics. This is fish meal um, production. Um, the catch of anchovetta uh, off the coast of Peru today averages around six million tons a year. It is by far the largest um, uh, catch of any uh, fish species in the wild. And it seems that this incredibly rich marine resource was the foundation of the first sedentary societies, the first people to stop moving around uh, in South America. Uh, and this was going on around about 7,000 years ago. So I've got a timeline here, which you can see this middle pre-ceramic um, where these marine hunter-gatherers were starting to settle down. And I'll follow this timeline as we go through um, the presentation. Uh, it also seems that the earliest crops here were, in fact, not food crops, but they were so-called industrial cultigens like cotton and gourds, which were used to intensify the harvest of marine resources, to, to make nets and lines and so forth, um, and to exploit these marine uh, res resources. Indeed, uh, Many would argue that the uh, marine resource base was the foundation of civilization itself. This is uh, Corral uh, on the central coast in the Supe Valley in Peru, uh, a famous site uh, excavated relatively recently by uh, Ruth Shadi and colleagues. Uh, and it is uh, the epitome of late pre-ceramic uh, monumental civilization uh, on the coast of Peru around about the third millennium BC. By the late pre-ceramic, you've got significantly larger populations and monumental architecture on this coast. Uh, and uh, these people do have food crops. They have uh, fruit trees and so forth, but their subsistence, their rubbish middens are still dominated by marine resource remains, fish and mollusks and so forth. And so this actually challenges the idea the, uh, that, that uh, agriculture is, is necessary for the rise uh, of civilization at all. Now, the last idiosyncrasy uh, I'd like to mention is that there were no, at least uh, in, initially, no cereals in the story of agriculture in the Andes. Uh, and cereals, if we think about you know, plants of the grass family like wheat, or, or barley or rice, uh, almost the definition of agriculture in our minds. And yet in South America, it seems that this uh, story was rather different. As the American geographer Carl Sauer point, was pointing out long ago, there's a contrast between domestication of starchy root crops in South America, epitomized, of course, by the potato, uh, against uh, seed far what he called seed farmers in, uh, in other parts of the world. Now, there were very important starch sources uh, in the Andes, not least, of course, the potato uh, and many other tubers. And there were pseudo cereals, the quinopods and amaranths, uh, such as quinoa, which, of course, is now uh, very popular in Europe. Very high protein um, grains, but not actual, actually members of the grass family, but rather uh, members of the amaranth family until maize, until maize. Uh, and this is a picture of uh, a variety of Andean maize cobs. Um, maize is the only true cereal uh, in the New World. Um, it originated, um, so far as we know, in Mexico. Uh, the genetic evidence is pretty powerful for that. Uh, and yet it went on to apparently 
develop more diversity in in South America than it uh, even than it did in Mesoamerica. So in that sense, it's antithetical to Vavilov's uh, logic. Um, there were very complex societies and civilizations in the high Andes uh, without maize, uh, based on what I called earlier at the higher altitude domesticate package, uh, such as potatoes, quinoa and camelids. Uh, and the uh, most famous of these was Tiwanaku, uh, up at 13,000 foot, uh, 4,000 meters above sea level on the Altiplano around Lake Titicaca in Bolivia. This is an aerial shot of Tiwanaku. Uh, indeed, it was the world's highest ancient uh, urban center, um, and uh, nonetheless, uh, I would argue that maize conveys certain uh, critical um, advantages to any subsistence regime. This is a picture uh, from the south coast where I work of a, of a traditional maize bean intercrop uh, field. Um, Maize is a very ecologically flexible crop. Um, it can be moved through many different ecologies, which is one of the reasons, uh, no doubt, it was able to be moved from Mexico uh, into South America. Uh, it provides a high production, uh, a critically storable source of carbohydrates. Now, maize uh, can be ground into flour or made into, into beer. Um, the potato can be stored, it can be freeze dried in certain high altitude um, conditions of the Andes, um, but in many other uh, parts of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the landscape, uh, that is not so, not so easy as it is with maize. Uh, and also maize can be grown in, uh, in this uh, famous uh, triumvirate of, of crops, the so-called the famous three sisters, um, maize, beans and squash which grow together very well because whereas maize is extracting lots of nutrients from the soil, uh, beans are a legume and fixing nitrogen. So they grow together very well as I've tried to capture in this intercropping photograph. Um, and together they indeed, they provide uh, almost perfect uh, human uh, nutrition. When and how maize spread to South America is, uh, as Hugh Iltis puts it, still a somewhat a contentious story. But what's not contentious uh, for our purposes here is firstly that maize was the paramount crop of the Inca Empire, which the old world encountered in the 15th century um, in Peru. Uh, and it was underpinning populations of many millions of people. Uh, the second uh, fact which is relatively uncontentious is that maize is rare in the archibotanical record before let's say around 2500 bp so in, you can see the green shading in the in the timeline here and by the early horizon it's ubiquitous across uh, the archibotanical record in peru so following this uh, unfolding of agriculture we have a an archaeological story, which I think can be um, uh, uh, broken down into an idea of horizons, which I've uh, highlighted here in green on the on the timeline. Uh, that's when the archaeological record seems to reflect some sort of homogeneity in over large areas of the Andes, some forms of Pan-Andean expansions of uh, ideas and or people. And they are interspersed, as I've highlighted in yellow here, by the uh, so-called intermediate periods. That's uh, when these horizons seem to break down into a much more localized, fragmented archaeological record, uh, reflecting more regional diversity. Now, the most well-known of these horizons is the late horizon. That's the, the, the Inca Empire, which the Spanish encountered in the 15th century. The Incas themselves called their realm Tehuantinsuyu, which can be glossed as the four realms together. It was the largest empire in the pre-Columbian Americas. Um, it's uh, some 2,600 miles north to south, so that's greater than the distance from London to Moscow. It takes in parts of what are today uh, five modern nations, so it was a vast uh, polity. 
it embraced uh, populations of around between 10 and 15 million people uh, in at least different, at least 80 different uh, ethnic groups. And these people were sustained, as I've uh, emphasized, by a very sophisticated agricultural system. Indeed, by this time, the entire Andean landscape itself appears to be domesticated, molded uh, by, the, by this uh, millennia of agriculture, epitomized by these maize terraces in, in Pisac in the Sacred Valley. Now, the Inca Empire was, was very large, uh, and yet it uh, defies many of the old world conventions of what an empire or, or a state uh, is, because I, I sort of paraphrase it here, saying it was an empire forged without pen or sword. There were, there were no wheels, there was no currency, apparently no markets no writing in the Inca Empire, and I put a question mark by that because there were certainly very sophisticated recording systems in the form of Inca quipu, uh, knotted cords, uh, such as the one I'm showing in this picture here. So, uh, slight question mark on what we mean by writing. But from a strictly Eurocentric point of view, what we seem to be looking at was you might you might call it a neolithic or a, or a bronze age civilization state economy in the empire it was uh, it, 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 it its political economy was based on labor on uh, the extraction of labor uh, taxation state state wealth tributes and so forth was all carried out in the form of labor this is what a marxist might call uh, Inca mode of production. Indeed, uh, Marx was inspired by uh, what he learned about the uh, the first uh, uh, writings on Inca um, political economy when he was coming up with his ideas. But the point I'm going to emphasize here is that the Incas were around for a very short time and right at the top of this timeline here. Really, the empire endured for uh, less than a century on the orthodox uh, John Rowe Cabello uh, chronology. It rose very quickly, and then, of course, it was it encountered Spain uh, and it and it and it chatted. It is, if you like, only the icing on the top of this very deep cake of Andean civilization. Um, and it had been preceded by earlier horizons. So, first of all, the the middle horizon. Um, from around about uh, 500 uh, AD through to 1000 AD, which um, I think uh, there are in different interpretations of what the Middle Horizon was, but the orthodox idea was that it was an, a, 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 an empire akin to the Incas. Uh, it also arose out of the southern highlands of, of, of the Andes, but it was a sort of bipolar affair split between Tiwanaku, the site which we looked at earlier, uh, on the shores of, of Lake Titicaca and Wari, uh, one of the largest archaeological sites in South America near the city of Ayacucho today in Peru. Now, this is a shot of uh, Piquiacta, which is a, a Wari uh, site in the Lucre Basin, quite close to uh, Cusco, the later Inca capital. Um, and so I'm using this shot to uh, show you that uh, there the Wari left many uh, testaments to what one might call state-level society stamped across the Andean landscape, such as these huge urban centers like Piquiacta. Now, Piquiacta is not the Wari capital, um, but it's far larger than the much later Inca capital in Cusco, which was close by. So what Wari were doing were co-opting labor for public works, building roads, military duties, building uh, terraces and so forth, uh, and thereby intensifying uh, their agricultural production. Indeed, uh, here's a quipu from the Middle Horizon. So these, uh, the, the, the recording system which we know about from the Incas has its roots in the, in the, in the Wari Middle Horizon. Uh, indeed, many of the, uh, I, so what one might think about, Inca statecraft, the road system, the labor tax, etc., all of these had their roots uh, in the Wari Middle Horizon. It had been 
preceded by an even more ancient age of Pan-Andean expansion, the Chavin Early Horizon. This is going on during the first millennium BC. Uh, and uh, Julio C. Teo, who was the first uh, uh, significant Peruvian archaeologist, um, this is his team ex excavating uh, uh, Chavin de Huanta, the central site of, of, of the Chavin Early Horizon, uh, high in the highlands of Ancash um, in the 1920s. He, uh, Teo, uh, conceived of Chavin as, the, as a mother culture for Andean civilization. Um, today, archaeological uh, uh, orthodoxy would see Chavin as a sort of proselytizing religious cult. Um, I've, uh, I've, I'm showing you here a picture of the eminent uh, British archaeologist Colin Renfrew face to face with the Lanson, which is uh, the uh, central carved stelae uh, in the sub subterranean uh, tunnels under the, the uh, Chavin de Wanta uh, temple. Um, uh, he memorid, memorably describes uh, this uh, Lanson as the oldest, oldest cult object still in situ in the world, but it's capturing this uh, religious power of the, of the Chavin iconography. This was also Coincidentally, uh, I, I, I say rhetorically, of course, the time when maize becomes ubiquitous in the archaeological record. Uh, and it is also the uh, earliest time depths for the uh, plausible time depths for the expansions of the major Andean language families, such as Quechua and Aymara. But if we think about um, Karal then and the late pre ceramic, uh, many uh, more recently would argue that the late pre-ceramic was, uh, was this uh, mother culture for Andean civilization. Um, Corral is often uh, uh, marketed now as the oldest city in the Americas. Uh, it, well, it wasn't the oldest uh, and it wasn't a city, um, but it's certainly a spectacular uh, monumental piece of uh, ar archaeology. But there is still a lot of debate about what sort of society lay behind sites like Corral. There is very little iconography in these sites. There's very little uh, evidence indeed of significant urban populations. Uh, and they don't seem to have expanded very much out of their immediate uh, river valley uh, hinterlands. Now, my presentation has necessarily obscured many uncertainties. Of course, I've rattled through thousands of years uh, in, in a short time. But I suppose the take-home message that I'm trying to convey here is that the horizons uh, were prima facie manifestly different to the intermediate periods. The horizons give us the best evidence for expansion of w whether that be expansion of people or, or ideas and languages. Different things are happening in the, in the, in the horizons to the intermediate periods. Uh, that doesn't mean, of course, that the intermediate periods are not interesting. Indeed, uh, a lot of my research has been focused, uh, as Ed uh, mentioned uh, at the beginning, on Nazca, which is going on during the uh, so-called early intermediate period. Um, and this is the Nazca geoglyphs on the Pampa of uh, San Jose in the south coast of Peru. Um, in the early 20th century, indeed, the early intermediate period was characterized sometimes as the master craftsman period to try and capture the extraordinary quality of, uh, of the material culture of both of Nazca and of uh, their contemporaries on the north coast of Peru, Moche. So this is um, some Nazca uh, textiles, uh, a nose mask uh, and, uh, and um, some ceramics to try and uh, reflect what I'm talking about there. I'd like to quickly set the time, um, the chronology I've been talking about uh, in a sort of comparative perspective, because I think it, it has the capacity to sometimes surprise us and challenge some of our preconceptions. So the first thing, if we start with the Incas, I'd like to emphasize is that the Incas actually, everybody travels to, to, to Peru to see the Incas, but they're really not very old. Uh, I mean, Machu Picchu is 15th, 16th century, so is King's College, uh, Cambridge. Um, 
On the other hand, this is hardly a new world. If we think about uh, sites like Corral being uh, built around uh, during the, the third millennium BC, this is contemporary with Stonehenge uh, or the pyramids of Giza. I think it also um, uh, behoves us to think about relative hierarchies of sophistication. I'm trying to reflect that here by uh, you know, Anglo-Saxons, uh, famous for their for their metalwork, and uh, but Moche on the north coast of Peru. This is an ear spool from the famous Lord of Sipan burial uh, to show you what uh, some of the uh, extraordinary metalworking, which uh, was also being carried out on the on in the in the Andes at that time. Indeed, if one thinks about uh, the beginnings of the Anglo-Saxons, they were of course uh, uh, when they first arrived in Britain uh, illiterate. Uh, and yet in Mesoamerica, the classic Maya were, were, were literate at the same time. I think another um, thing which we could think about is uh, relative scale of political con control, because when the Spanish encountered the Inca Empire, uh, they encountered a political uh, a, a, and a, 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 an economic a, and a social order within a vast geography for which they had uh, no uh, uh, comparable uh, touchstone in Europe at the time. Indeed, probably the only polity on the planet which was of a comparable scale at that time, a greater scale, was, was Ming Dynasty China. So this, the Spaniards are continually turning to ancient Rome to make their comparisons with what they see in the Inca Empire. And uh, I'm trying to reflect that with a short quote here by a famous uh, Peruvian one of the most famous chroniclers, Gassi Lasso, and he's talking about the Inca fortress above Cusco, Sacsayhuaman, the greatest and proudest work that the Incas ordered built to demonstrate their power and majesty was the fortress of Cusco. And he writes that uh, to any who has not seen it, its dimensions sound incredible. But to any who has seen it and studied it with care, they make him imagine and believe that they were made by some form of magic built by demons rather than men. So then, to go back to this uh, rhetorical question I posed at the beginning, the so what question uh, and Machu Picchu and its sublime beauty, why does uh, the story of, of human um, uh, trajectory in the Andes matter for the wider story of humanity? Well, I, I hope I've, I've shown you a little bit of why uh, it matters because of the story of agriculture here and the deep time uh, pristine trajectory of its subsequent uh, civilization. Because if we think about um, the significance of this, uh, the impact of the old world on the new world is fairly well appreciated, right? Rich empires such as the Incas fell, M millions of people d died of disease and so forth, uh, and yet it's often overlooked that the impact the other way around was almost uh, as great. Uh, and this is due to the exchange of plants which, uh, 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 which took place across from the New World to the Old World, what Crosby called the Columbian Exchange uh, in the aftermath of the uh, encounter between the Old World and the New World. And this impact was really due to millennia of quiet, patient work by humble Andean farmers. Because if we think of the, the 12 or 13 food staple crops that, as Schultes and Hoffman put it, stand in effect between us and starvation, it turns out that almost half of those crops originated, or in the case of maize, developed most of its diversity in the Andes. So we have maize, we have the potato, of course, we have phaseolus beans, these are butter beans, haricot beans, and so forth. We have manioc and sweet potato. These plants uh, support uh, millions of people across the Pacific and in Africa today. And we have peanuts, which are the source of groundnut oil, which is the major traded vegetable oil today. There are many other important Andean domesticates, varieties of uh, cotton, tomato, pumpkins, and so forth. The, uh, 
Peruvian form of cotton is now the form of cotton, Gisipium barbadense, which dominates world industrial production. Uh, there are other crops like uh, tobacco, coca, which is the, the source of cocaine and so forth. Um, but I, I, I think that this story uh, calls for, uh, for us to imagine for a moment Italian cuisine with no tomatoes in it or Far Eastern cuisine with no chili peppers, begging the question, if you like, how traditional is traditional? John Hemming, in his marvelous book, The Conquest of the Incas, puts it that the world's annual potato harvest is worth many times the value of all the treasure and precious metals taken from the Inca Empire by its conquerors. Indeed, some historians might even argue that the Industrial Revolution was only enabled by the introduction of the starch source of the Andean potato into, nor into Northern Europe. There are uh, other parts of the story, the world tobacco industry and the cocaine trade, obviously less beneficial, of course, but they are nonetheless strikingly, hugely significant to today's politics, economics, uh, healthcare, and so forth. So they all underline my point that this story of Andean prehistory, and in particular its millennia of uh, plant domestication, helps define the way we are today. And I kept try and show that the picture of my friend here who's perhaps been overindulging in the potato crisps. So thank you very much and uh, naturally I'm happy to take any uh, questions you might have. David, thank you so much. Um, that was that was really enthralling. I, I, um, I had a lot of questions but you answered most of them as we went along, <laughs> which uh, is always a sign of a good talk. Um, I, I have got a couple here uh, that have popped up, and I'm going to ask you one now. Um, um, how do you believe that the Andean civilizations might have developed, uh, e.g. technologically or politically, um, had the European conquests not happened? It's a very, it's an interesting question. Uh, and. Uh, it sort of uh, invites one to speculate in the way that archaeologists are perhaps loath to do. Um, but uh, I mean, Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs and Steel was on on this theme in a sense, trying to identify the, 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 the different features of, of these trajectories and where they were headed. Um, I think one of the things which one can say in terms of political economy was that the Incas had a form of a very successful form of of, uh, of a welfare state. I mean, the Spanish were very struck by the lack of poor people which they saw in the Inca Empire. I mean, the the flip side of that was that there was no individual freedom, there was no social mobility, uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, as I mentioned, Marx was inspired by um, what he understood about uh, Inca political economy, and so. Um, uh, perhaps that's one aspect in which um, uh, th that Andean trajectory might have uh, continued to unfold into something more similar to uh, things we we, we see uh, I uh, in the 20th century uh, in, in the rest of the world. Thank you. And um, um, I see in the in the chat, Carol's put a question. Uh, which is a chronological one, um, uh, when did salt mining begin in the Highlands? And I wonder how that fits in with your chronology. Well, again, that's a, uh, there are famous uh, salt mines quite close to, well, on the edge of the Sacred Valley, which might be what's putting her in mind of that uh, question. Uh, I'm not aware of any excavation which has been done there to to, to work out the time depth of that particular extraction, but I suppose it'd be fairly um, reasonable to assume that that it, it was going on for a great many millennia. That and many other salt sources in 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 the Andes, um, and salt was traded uh, by camelid caravans uh, up and down the Andes. We know that it was one of the major. Um, products which has moved around uh, in pre-Columbian times and indeed into historical times too. Um, 
because there were salt sources in the high Andes and there were salt sources on the coast. And then there, there were other parts of the Andes and down into Amazonia, which had no salt. So it was an important commodity to move around. But I can't specifically answer the question of when that started. I would think, I would think uh, over, over many thousands of years. Thank you, David. And, and another one that's just popped up in the chat, also chronological, but going back maybe a little bit further, uh, to what extent do you judge the effect of the end of the last ice age around 10,000 years ago may have kick-started the initiation of Andean civilization? Well, that's, uh, that is interesting too, because for a long time, I suppose the orthodox expert, I mean, this great change, the, the, the so-called agricultural revolution, this great change in the human trajectory, what's curious about it is that we still have no real explanation for why it happened. Um, the orthodox explanation used to be that it was to do with changing climates at the end of the Pleistocene, so that hunter-gatherers were forced um, by, a, by a warming earth uh, in certain parts of the world, like the Near East, uh, to adopt uh, agriculture as a, as, a, as a new way of living by climate change, by what was happening um, at the end of the Ice Age. That uh, idea is now... Um, very much questioned uh, in the Near East um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, so I think we still don't really know. Uh, having said that, this change is going on globally. So clearly, whatever is driving it after hundreds of thousands of, of, of years living as hunter gatherers is some sort of global change for it, ha for it to happen sim simultaneously, but in the Near East and in the Andes, for instance. Um, so uh, I think that myself that climate is going to is certainly going to be part of this part of the explanation, but it's it, it doesn't seem to be all the explanation for a variety of very complicated reasons, which um, are perhaps beyond our scope this evening. Yes, thank you. Uh, and another question here. Uh, what do you make of the suggestions that some Peruvian archaeological sites actually date to much earlier than previously thought? Um, and the parallel debate about the date of the first known human civilizations across the Americas. Uh, okay, well, like, that depends a bit on what we mean by, uh, 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 you know, when this uh, change in in perception of of time depth uh, took place, because I think it's it's very well established, very well known, as I've shown with sites like Corral, that by the third millennium BC there was very complex uh, uh, civilization going on on the uh, in South America. Um, so uh, uh, unless um, we're talking about some sort of Graham Hancock uh, idea, which I, which I don't want to go down. Um, that, then, uh, then I think it's 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 not that new. The recognition that the Andes uh, and and indeed Mesoamerica had uh, very early complex society going on by you know contemporary with with the pyramids of Giza. Thank that's been, that's been known for the last uh, fifteen twenty years. Great. Um, and um, um, oh, now a quick question came just to me, just a quick one. Was Cabello from Santander in Spain and what is he known for? Well, I don't know the answer to that question. Cabello is one of the uh, important chroniclers. Um, so one of the first Spaniards who, 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 they, they call, who, was, who was writing down um, uh, what they were told about Inca history and so forth. Uh, and uh, and his uh, succession of of, of Inca uh, uh, emperors is has a has precise dates to, attached to it after Inca Pachacuti um, uh, Yupanqui. So there's then a sequence previous to that. The the Incas are probably mythical, but at, on on Pachacuti's uh, ascension to to being being emperor things start getting more historical. And from that, there are precise dates mentioned in the chronology given to Cabello by the Incas. More about the man Cabello and where, where he was from, I'm not sure, I'm afraid. He, I mean, he's doubtless from, from, from somewhere in Spain, but, uh, but I don't know about his personal history. Thank you. And um, I, I liked your slide where you were comparing um, Stonehenge and um, 
and Corral uh, being of a similar age, uh, I guess you could say um, both of them were, were from cultures that worshipped the sun. Um, do you think the sun was particularly significant in, in, in the um, people we've been talking about today, or do you think that is just living under a big flaming ball in the sky? Well, right. I, I, I mean, clearly Stonehenge is aligned with solar um, uh, solstices and so forth. Uh, I don't know that we we know that the people uh, who built Corral uh, over over a millennia, over a very long time period, um, were worshipping the sun. Uh, they may very well have been, but uh, I don't know of any evidence that they were. Um, the idea of of the sun as a as a, as, a, as something uh, as a as a deity comes up is really something we know about from the Incas, who of course are thousands of years later. Uh, and indeed, I think most uh, Inca uh, experts believe that um, that it was a relatively late adoption, probably by by this by Inca Pachacuti, who who decided that he was the earthly um, uh, manifestation of Inti of the sun, um, and that previous Incas hadn't hadn't made that uh, that claim. So. Um, uh, the sun was always is clearly in a very significant part of Inca cosmology um, prior to Pachacuti, uh, along with uh, thunder and lightning and the rainbow and various other things. Um, but uh, I don't know that I would be comfortable in characterizing even the late Incas as sun worshippers in the sense that um, that question seems to imply. David, thank you very much. I think that brings us to the end of our questions and it brings us neatly, uh, nearly to the end of our hour. Uh, I can't thank you enough. What, a, what an interesting talk. I think I'm going to have to go and listen to the recording myself to make sure it all sinks in. So thank you on behalf of the whole audience here uh, and Cambridge, of course. Thank you very much indeed. No, thank you for your interest.